Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Supporting General Practice to Manage Influenza and, in, and Respiratory Infections. My name is Kira Wright. I'm the Immunisation Team Leader here at CESFIN. Um, and I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Mimi Campbell and Fleur Niven, uh, as well as Dr. Gary Franks and Kate Schleeman. Uh, and of course, Lucy Deng. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. We recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. We would also like to extend that, that respect to any Aboriginal colleagues joining us today. Just giving you an update on some of our um, our services that are happening at CESFIN at the moment. So um, just wanted to remind our colleagues of the COVID at home service. So this service is uh, for patients who are COVID positive um, and don't have a regular GP that does home visits. Um, referrals can be accepted um, through our uh, coronavirus at CESFIN email address and there's more information on our website. Um, our Vax at Home service as well, this is for housebound patients who are not able to leave their house that are 16 years and over. Um, we've been doing this service uh, for about a year now um, and it's been a great service so far. So now we're doing the COVID vaccination boosters and also flu vax when required. Referrals are accepted um, from GPs and LHDs. Patient referrals are not accepted. So you have to make sure that, you're, um, that the GP is the one filling in the online form um, and that's also available on our website. Uh, lastly, this is um, our new and exciting um, program, the Sutherland Shire COVID-19 Respiratory Kids Pro Program. So an EOI was sent out by CESFIN uh, to practices in Sutherland Shire. And uh, at the moment, Kirawi Family Medical have put their hand up. So that's an on-site clinic between Monday and Thursday, 5 till 7 p.m. and Saturdays from midday till 2. Um, so that's to take a bit of the burden off um, the ED in the Sutherland Shire. Um, and the EOI has been extended, so if anyone else is interested, please fill in the EOI as soon as possible. All right, now to the interesting bit. Uh, our first update is from uh, Dr. Lucy Deng. She's a staff specialist and clinical lecturer at NCIS. Um, she's a general paediatrician and she holds a conjoint appointment as clinical lecturer in the discipline of child and adolescent health um, at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Lucy is the clinical lead of OSVAC Safety and it's also a part of the New South Wales Immunisation Specialist Service team, she, which helped us a lot during our COVID time. Uh, she is currently complete, completing a PhD in severe acute neurological events following immunisation. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Kira. Um, uh, I too also would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land we're all meeting on today. And for me, it's the Gadigal land. Um, and I'd also like to extend my respect to um, Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging and anyone online. Um, thanks also to Sestin for the um, invitation to speak to you tonight um, for the next kind of half an hour or so. Just wanted to go through some of the respiratory viruses that we're seeing back in Australian shores. Um, uh, it's no surprise that uh, the sniffles are definitely here and probably here to stay for a little while longer. Um, so uh, there's definitely something in the air and it's not just COVID. Um, we're seeing a lot of influenza-like illnesses, um, both I'm sure in the, emergent, um, the GP setting, but also in the emergency setting. Uh, this comes from the um, New South Wales uh, uh, EPI report um, that's now, uh, well, that is incorporated together with the COVID surveillance report. Um, you can see in the big uh, dark uh, black line um, is the influenza-like illness presentations um, across this year. Um, compared to previous years, so 2021 is in the uh, magenta, which is barely visible, as well as the 2020, which is in the blue, that is also barely visible. I think you guys will remember that 2019 was one of the worst flu seasons um, uh, in, in the last decade, and that almost doesn't compare to what we're seeing at the moment. Um, I know this graph kind of shows that we're on the downward trend, um, but equally in the 2019 um, uh, uh, flu season is that it, there was a second um, kind of uptick. So uh, while we're seeing a little bit of a break in the last couple of weeks, um, 
probably shouldn't be too complacent. And uh, I think we would be expecting, if not flu-like illnesses, but still other respiratory um, viruses to continue to circulate in the weeks and months to come. Um, just kind of looking at a breakdown for the flu-like illnesses, um, really the majority of uh, the presentations are coming from the under fives, which is not surprising. Um, but we're actually also seeing a fair few flu-like illnesses in kind of the healthy uh, 18 to 39 year old uh, group as well. Um, and obviously across the course of this year, um, we're seeing a big uptick in the recent couple of weeks and months. Um, this is a further breakdown for uh, flu, uh, confirmed flu cases. Um, and again, uh, the youngest group, so the zero to nines are the most common, um, but really, uh, and, and the incidence or prevalence actually decreases as we go with the ages. Um, we're really seeing mostly flu A this year. I uh, haven't actually seen any, if at all, um, flu B. Um, and that takes up the majority of what we're seeing. Um, most of them, unfortunately, they're untyped mainly because they come from rapid antigen testing. Um, but we're seeing more flu um, A in the H3N2 um, out of the ones that we're typing um, in laboratories. But flu is not the only thing that's circulating. Um, uh, this is some of the epigraphs from uh, the other more common uh, respiratory viruses. So just walking you through this, um, adenovirus is seeing a pretty big uptick um, and we're expecting to kind of continue to see this. Um, RSV um, is no surprise um, that uh, we're seeing a massive uptick compared to previous years. And just to orientate you in terms of how big the uptick is, the average from 2016 to 2019 is actually in the grey, and that sits down here. Um, now, we know that RSV is a, a common winter virus, um, but even then, um, it usually is in kind of the thousands rather than the four or five thousands that we're seeing at the moment. Um, equally, is we're still seeing kind of paraflu hanging around HMPV, rhinovirus and enterovirus. So uh, a really big mixed pot out there at the moment, um, which probably doesn't help um, bring any relief in terms of seeing patients on a daily and a weekly basis. So with all the different circulating viruses around, what's different this year compared to previous years? Um, as an emergency physician at the Kids Hospital at Westmead, what we're seeing a lot more is that we're seeing people with high fevers compared to previous years Kids with more prolonged symptoms, so people coming in saying that they've had, you know, cough, runny nose, um, fevers for five, six days rather than the usual couple of days. Um, we're seeing a lot more of myalgia and arthralgia, particularly with our flu patients. Um, so older kids coming in and unable to walk because they've got muscle pain uh, from myositis um, that's related to flu. Um, and, and so all of these things are really kind of making uh, kids kind of present to ED a lot more frequently than we've ever expected. Um, so that, what does that mean for us? Um, this is a snapshot from earlier this year, but we're not really seeing anything different even in the past week. Um, at Kids Hospital out at Westmead, we're probably seeing about 200 kids a day um, and out at Randwick about 130, 140 a day. And this is well above what we expect in the peak of winter. Um, I think normally in the peak of winter, we probably see about 70% of what we're seeing at the moment. Um, in terms of hospital admissions, that's equating to about 400 uh, hospital admissions a week um, at Westmead and about 160 a week um, at Randwick. And these aren't elective admissions, these are admissions through the emergency department. So what actually happens, and this is no surprise to you guys, uh, when someone comes into ED is um, if you're sickest, you get seen first. Um, so if we have a look at our breakdown of our um, uh, category or triage categories is um, the la a large proportion, about 60% are actually category four patients. Um, our, ca our cat one, cat twos probably take about 10 to 15% um, and the remainder being cat three. Now with 200 patients going through our emergency department um, on a daily basis, it it's actually meaning that our CAT 4s are having wait times of somewhere between 4 and 12 hours, depending on the day. Um, and so 
uh, it is unfortunate, but it does mean that we're still seeing all the really serious cases. All our CAT 2s are still being seen within the first 10 minutes or so, our CAT 3s within half an hour. Um, but having you know, uh, that larger uh, workload means that the CAT 4s are sitting in our waiting room for several hours. Um, while they do get uh, kind of hourly reviews by a nurse, um, it means that they don't get to see a doctor for several hours and that's probably substandard care for anybody who has to go to an emergency department. Um, so how do, uh, I, I know later on in this uh, um, uh, talk, um, you'll get uh, a review of how other, uh, some GP clinics kind of run through and triage respiratory patients and make sure your workplace is safe. Um, and I just wanted to walk through what we do in our emergency department, um, whether that's useful for you guys to take home. So when someone comes into our emergency department, they get triaged. Um, and after triage, everyone gets a rat. Um, at the moment, they get a COVID rat as well as an RSV and a flu rat. Um, the RSV and the flu rat really just help us kind of help diagnose kids a little bit faster. We try and treat um, get them seen a little bit quicker because they've got a clear diagnosis. Um, but really it's the COVID rats that um, help us kind of do uh, infection control. So if you're positive for COVID, you get a lucky uh, single room to yourself uh, while you wait to be seen. Um, your seeing time is still related to your triage time. So it doesn't mean that you get seen a little bit faster if you've got COVID. Um, if you're fortunate or possibly unfortunate that you have COVID, don't have COVID, is you get sent back to the waiting room while you wait with everybody else with a different respiratory virus. Um, all uh, patients um, above the age of 12 um, and all adults are required to wear a mask while in the waiting room. Um, and um, all clinicians in our emergency department um, have masks um, and goggles um, from a PPE point of view. So how many of these patients actually get admitted into hospital? Um, if you look uh, at a breakdown by age group, um, obviously the youngest ones, um, uh, 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 the zero to fours are more likely to get um, admitted compared to the five to um, 16s. But really it's the older population that's um, um, a lot more likely to require hospital admissions. So the 65 plus. Um, and surprisingly, there is a big cohort of 35 to 64 year olds who are requiring hospital admissions for influenza-like illnesses. Um, I think this kind of highlights the importance in, the, um, uh, in terms of conveying the severity of flu. Um, I think we've kind of, you know, pre, prior to COVID and even now is we kind of think flu is, oh, it's just the cold and the reality is it really isn't. Um, so, what does that mean for kind of the, I guess, from my point of view, what does it mean for the kids under 16 who actually comes into hospital and requires urgent care? So these are kind of our criteria for admission um, more generally. So the first three is related to your respiratory effort and um, uh, distress. So if you know, a kid has moderate to severe respiratory distress, is desaturating or has episodes of apnea. Um, they all come into hospital. Um, the second one's really related to your hydration. Uh, we all know that if you're sick, you're less likely to eat and drink normally. Um, so if your input um, or output is less than 50% of your normal, you're more likely to require an admission for uh, basically uh, fluid support, whether that's through NG rehydration or intravenous fluids. If you have a pre-existing condition and you're more likely to deteriorate relatively quickly, um, we have a lower threshold for admission. Um, the non-weight bearing really relates to kids who ha have been presenting with myositis or myalgia. Um, from a safety point of view, um, really not uh, feasible for a kid who's not walking, um, who is normally ambulant, um, to be uh, arrested and monitored at home. Um, so that's a reason for them to come to hospital. If you're septic, um, usually, and that's usually related to the final point, is that uh, while we know and expect that kids are getting longer periods of fevers this year with their respiratory illnesses, is that anyone who's got a prolonged fever is more likely to get a secondary bacterial infection. Um, so 
we treat those kids relatively seriously. And in fact, both at Westmead and at Randwick Hospital this year, we've seen a lot of secondary pneumococcal infection as a result of flu and RSV. Um, so it's really important that um, if someone has a fever for more than seven days that they do get reviewed, they should get a blood culture and some bloods done. Um, if they're normal, they do get to go home from the emergency department, but if there's anything abnormal, we treat them um, for presumed secondary bacterial infection. Um, in terms of resources for uh, your parent, parents and, and families is there's quite a lot um, out there um, uh, done by our kids hospital. Um, so if you Google winter and your sick kid, you'll see some lovely uh, videos from some of our clinicians. So this is Carl from Westmead Children's Hospital telling you uh, things to look out for um, that will warrant a presentation to the emergency department. And this is Brenda McMullen from Randwick Kids um, uh, encouraging flu vaccination and again kind of reiterating the signs and symptoms to look out for um, that warrants an emergency presentation and review. Um, at a GP setting uh, and also even in our emergency, um, we do have antivirals for flu. Um, there are three um, that are available, um, Tamiflu, Relenza and Rapavab. Um, they're all used in very similar ways. Um, so there's two um, uh, aspects of using uh, antivirals for flu. The first one's for treatment for cases. So children under the age of five, adults greater than 65 years old, um, pregnant women, immunocompromised patients, and those with significant comorbidities. Essentially, they're the ones who are more likely to have severe disease. They're also the ones who we recommend COVID, uh, sorry, flu vaccination. Um, if, uh, if uh, anyone who kind of falls in that, into this category presents with flu um, uh, within 48 hours of their symptom onset, they should be commenced on an antiviral for five days. Equally is you can use antivirals as prophylaxis and the recommendation is to use them for um, uh, long-term residential care um, uh, patients, uh, those who are immunocompromised and those who aren't vaccinated who've been exposed to flu. Um, exposure meaning um, they, they, if uh, confirmed flu as an exposure within um, 48 hours um, and from a prophylaxis point of view is they do require a longer course of antivirals, so 10 days to cover their uh, incubation period and potential infection period. Um, also like to kind of point out um, here is that we also have antivirals for COVID. Um, the indications have recently been expanded. Um, so the link below um, has the updated eligibility list, but essentially it's Older people, so 70 and above, 50 and above with two risk factors, indigenous population with two risk factors, or those with severe uh, to moderate immunocompromising conditions. Um, antivirals for COVID need to be commenced within five days of symptom onset for them to be effective. And there's two types that uh, you can use with a slightly different regimen. So Paxlovid um, is really a combination um, antiviral with two different types. Um, and Lajfuro is a, a single one. Um, uh, and both of them require BD dosing for about five days. Um, I don't need to tell you guys all prevention is always better than a cure. So while we have antivirals for both flu and for, for COVID, um, really we should try and be preventing these rather than treating them. Um, and as I've mentioned before, um, it's really not just the flu. Um, this is a, uh, a graph of kind of your uh, risk of morbidity um, by age group. So I'll orientate you, your x-axis is how old you are. Um, this is your risk for uh, your mortality risk when you have COVID. Um, and actually, since we've had um, a less um, severe uh, variant of COVID, um, seasonal flu mortality is actually much higher in the younger age groups than COVID and about the same for the older age groups. So um, as great as we have been in promoting COVID vaccination, we should be equally um, uh, uh, we should equally be promoting flu vaccination for the same reasons we promote COVID vaccines. Not so much for prevention of actual disease, um, but really prevention of severe disease that includes hospitalization and death. 
Um, so while we, uh, in New South Wales, we, um, the flu uh, program was expanded to all ages um, up until recently. Um, but, you know, as you guys all know, flu is still free for kids um, uh, from six months to under five years, as well as for all the other um, at-risk groups. Um, and if a parent goes, well, you know, why is it important for my kid to get flu vaccine? Probably important to remind them that one in a thousand kids aged under five are admitted to hospital for flu. Um, two in a thousand kids under the age of six months are admitted um, to hospital for flu. And this is important in terms of vaccinating uh, pregnant women. Um, and half of these kids are actually completely healthy kids. So we're not really just talking about kids with comorbidities. Um, it is really important to vaccinate all kids where possible. Um, this is looking at our flu uh, coverage data. Um, so overall in Australia, I think we're really, really good. Um, you guys are really, really good at uh, vaccinating the elderly. Um, so the slightly darker blue line is the over 65s. Um, but really what we need to improve on is the younger age groups. So the red line and the light blue line um, are the zero to less than fives, um, particularly um, is that at the moment it's sitting around, well, 25% uh, or so. Um, and importantly, is um, we can do it even better in the Indigenous population. We know their outcomes are a little bit poorer than the average Australian. Um, and while we're doing a fantastic job in the older, uh, greater than 65 year olds, um, uh, we can definitely improve coverage rate in the younger age groups. Um, if a leaderboard is anything to help you, uh, I, get your competitiveness up is that we also do have in, on New South Wales Health website coverage data by LGAs. Um, so uh, depending on where you guys are, um, get those numbers up for your LGA. Um, as a safe a vaccine safety uh, specialist, um, I often get asked, oh, you know, um, I've had a bad reaction to flu. Um, I've never had a bad the flu vaccine, but I've never had, you know, a bad flu, why should I get it? Um, and so there's really good data on the OzVac safety website in terms of the adverse events following your flu vaccine. Um, so this year, over 130, uh, 40,000 people have um, uh, completed this um, survey um, and only about kind of 18% have reported an adverse event. Now, while that seems relatively high, if you just look at the number, um, the number for COVID vaccines sits around 35%. So flu vaccination is actually a lot less reactogenic than COVID vaccines. So if every adult's been happy to get a COVID vaccine, they really should be happy to get a flu vaccine. And importantly, is very few people have really bad adverse events that require any attention at a GP or an emergency level. We have data that is also split by age groups. So parents often kind of go, oh, you know, um, how bad would my kid, what sort of a reaction will my child get? Um, and again, um, adverse reactions are pretty low in children. They're mostly just local adverse events and fatigue. 9% um, of kids will have a fever, um, but really um, very few of them require medical attention afterwards. Um, and few of them are really affected in terms of their regular activities. Um, so it's really important to um, counsel um, parents or um, kids about their expected adverse events um, following immunisation um, and to encourage that, you know, most of these can be very well managed um, as long as they know what to expect. As usual, every year we have a, a gazillion different type of flu vaccines out there. So it's really important to make sure you're giving the right vaccine to the right people. Um, there's lots of resources out there with beautiful pictures to remind you. Um, I'm sure your vaccine fridge is getting more and more complicated with the different formulations for different um, ages, uh, not only for flu, but also for COVID. Um, so really important to try and uh, uh, streamline that within your workplace. Um, Important to remember that it is okay to uh, co-administer COVID-19 vaccines together with flu, uh, particularly, um, and that's particularly important if you know people are coming in opportunistically for another reason um, and they're a harder to reach population. Um, all of the flu vaccines um, in circulation are latex free, um, so there shouldn't be any concern for those who um, have a latex allergy. 
And while um, some of the flu vaccines do have a small amount of egg component, they are all completely safe for um, people with um, egg allergy, including anaphylaxis. So uh, you don't need to pick a particular vaccine for those people. Um, and the monitoring period post-vaccination is still just 15 minutes. Again, there's a lot of um, really nice resources on the health website um, on flu um, that I've provided a link to here. Um, and then finally, um, just a little reminder about COVID vaccines is, you know, our boosters um, being recommended for 12 to 15 year olds with um, comorbidities, anyone who's um, older than uh, 16 years and above, um, and your primary course needed to be um, three months or more ago. Um, we've recently also expanded to a fourth dose or a winter booster for people aged 50, uh, 50 years and above who live in a care facility or if you're uh, 16 years and older with comorbidities. Um, and actually anyone who is 30 and above um, can have a booster vaccine if they choose to. Um, so I'd highly encourage um, uh, to, uh, to promote this. Um, but I think what's actually important is to uh, if you look at our coverage data in New South Wales, I actually think promoting the fourth dose is important, but actually we're missing a fair few people who haven't even had their original uh, third dose. And that's actually the population that we really need to get to. Um, so uh, there's still about 30% of the population who have not had their third dose. And your third dose is actually a lot more efficacious to preventing severe disease than getting the fourth dose in those who, are, who have already had three doses before. Um, so really important to still actually check and make sure that every, uh, you know, your patients have had their booster, whether that's their first booster or their second booster, um, because we can really improve this to prevent um, severe disease and hospitalizations. Um, we all know the saying vaccines work, um, but I recently was in a, a presentation and was reminded that vaccines work only if they're in arms. So really we should be changing this to say vaccinations work. Um, vaccines aren't particularly useful if they stay in our, our vaccine fridges. Um, so make sure that uh, you encourage everyone to get vaccinated. That's it from me, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. <clears throat> that was very interesting and um, good to see some ED data in those graphs. Um, I particularly like the one showing the mortality with flu versus COVID. That was great. Um, are there any questions from anybody? I'll give you a minute to fill in if there is. Um, in the meantime, I have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, first I wanted to know like so the, the people that go to ED um, and they're waiting hours in the cat four, um, cat five categories, and then they don't get admitted, what do the staff tell them to do? Um, you know, go back to the GP, just go home and have Panadol. Like what is, yeah, what's the recommendations? Yeah, we never really turn anyone away from the emergency department because, you know, parents come in because they obviously worry about their child. Um, so the nurses review them on a regular basis in terms of identifying their OBS, provide them with fluid rehydration within the uh, waiting area. Um, and so if the child deteriorates, they get up triage for review. And if not, we remind them that it, it looks like they're, you know, they're displaying the expected symptoms for respiratory symptoms. Um, we're at the moment not too concerned about them, but obviously they should get reviewed, uh, whether that's in, you know, waiting an unknown amount of time in the emergency department or finding time to see the GP. Um, so, uh, it, you know, I, I think the reality is a lot of um, parents um, struggle to find a GP to get to um, and, and, you know, um, uh, hear that, you know, GPs are also extremely busy with all their ex existing work. Um, and I think um, if it's possible, uh, we kind of need to think about other ways to see patients. Um, so we did trial kind of seeing kids virtually. Um, so then we can see a, a few more kids. Um, and, and that seemed to work um, in terms of, um, I guess, uh, seeing a few more. But I think by the time parents come to the emergency department, they're really expecting to see a doctor in person. So 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And um, in terms of the the bit you mentioned about um, parents not being able to maybe get to a GP, um, does that mean that there's more of this type of presentations to ED at night time than day? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, we actually see an influx of uh, parents are pretty smart. They try and, you know, beat the system in some way. So we, we often see a bit of an influx um, at the very early hours of the morning because mm -hmm. parents think, oh, if I come at 5 a.m. in the morning, they can't possibly be awake. Um, and it's actually very depressing when you turn up to work from morning shift <laughs> and <laughs> there's someone who's been waiting 12 hours, which oh. means that they were there at 8 p.m. last night and they still haven't been seen at 8 a.m. So mm. I think um, it's not so much that they haven't been able to find a GP at a particular time. It's just I think everyone's extremely busy. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then lastly, is there anything um, or what's the one thing that you could recommend that GPs can do to help e ease that ED burden? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think, um, you know, GPs have an excellent relationship with um, uh, with with existing, you know, your families. And so they trust you a lot. Um, so I think, you know, parents are very happy to speak to GPs that they know well um, to be essentially educated about the signs and symptoms they're looking out for. Um, the anxiety that I hear a lot about um, in the emergency department is really just, oh, what, sh what symptoms should I be worried about? Not so much, you know, you really need to listen to my child's chest or, um, you know, I, I really need that chest X-ray or whatnot is that parents don't really know what severe disease is. Um, and so, uh, you know, even if it's a phone call or a sh short chat to someone that, you know, a, a patient that you already know um, is extremely helpful to just to educate them to say, these are the symptoms that, you know, will really worry me and will really warrant you going into the hospital for a review uh, versus actually it's okay if, 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 you know, your kid's actually drinking okay and not breathing fast. Um, don't worry too much about the height of the fever, um, uh, but if it's, you know, uh, uh, going on for a really long time, do come in and see me or, like, go back to the emergency department. Yeah, to educating the parents about, you know, what are the worst outcomes versus what can wait till a GP appointment that they can hopefully get in a day or so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and also you mentioned trialing telehealth for um, respiratory and peds. Um, do you have any tips for telehealth with respiratory um, for, for kids? Because, um, you know, it can be quite hard to measure a chest over telehealth. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. Um, it is in some ways hard, but also it some in some ways it isn't. So, um what the chest, so so particularly if, if someone has symptoms for a couple of days is we know the risk of kind of a, a pneumonia for a child who's febrile got um, chorizal symptoms, so cough, runny nose for the first, you know, one, two or even three days is extremely low. Um, so what we're really assessing for um, in terms of the first couple of days is a child's work of breathing. Um, so I actually just get you know, the parents to lift up the kids' um, T-shirt up and I watch how they breathe. Um, and, and that tells you a lot more than what a stethoscope can tell you because, um, you know, even with kids with bronchiolitis, is you expect to hear lots of noises in their chest, but it's really about their work of breathing that um, really, uh, you know, um, is the telltale side of whether they need to come in or not. And um, I often explain to parents is that um, like if, if your child's struggling to breathe, um, kids know their ABCs. So if they're struggling with their airway and their breathing, they're not going to do their CDEs, which is their circulation. So and you know their fluids. So if then if their drinking has completely dropped off, that again is a very good um, kind of sign that then they're, they're not coping particularly well from a respiratory point of view. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, that's some um, good tips for me as a untrained clinical person. <laughs> um, hopefully that helped out some um, GPs to encourage more uh, telehealth consults with um, kids as well. Um, if no one else has any other questions, I might thank you very much for your time. Um, it was great insights and um, we will be sharing the slides after as well for anybody um, that wants to review. Um, and let me just go to my...
taking notes now. Um, so thank you, Lucy. Uh, next up, we have a recording um, from Dr. Daniel Chainchef. Uh, he's a, a GP at Green Square Health, and he couldn't be with us tonight. So he's made a little YouTube video um, to share how they treat uh, or they accommodate patients with respiratory symptoms um, at their clinic. So if I just go in and share my screen. Hi guys, I'm Daniel Chanashev, one of the GPs at Green Square Health, and I wanted to talk briefly about how we see patients with respiratory symptoms uh, at our clinic. The number one goal for us is to reduce the transmission, obviously, of COVID-19, um, but other respiratory illnesses to our staff, our doctors, our nurses, but also to the other patients who are attending our clinic as well. And to do this, we've got a multi-layered strategy. Um, which sounds like a lot at the beginning, but really it makes it quite effortless once the systems are in place. So one of the first things we do is to reduce the amount of people sharing any space at any one time. We offer an outdoor area for people to wait. So if the waiting room seems to be a bit crowded or if you just prefer to do so, you're welcome to wait outside. We've got chairs available and we've set up a check-in kiosk system. So once people have arrived to the clinic, they can just check in through the kiosk and not have to go inside and talk to a receptionist to let the clinic know that we're there. Next to that check-in kiosk, we've got a small uh, station that has surgical masks as well as hand sanitizer um, and a big A5 sign, that, <coughs> sorry, a big AO sign that explains to people that they're welcome to wait outside. Just let us know that they're here or that they can come inside, but they have to wear a mask covering their nose and mouth while they're in there. Um, the second mitigation we have in the waiting rooms to make sure that the air is being filtered continuously. And we try to achieve greater than six air exchanges per hour by using three HEPA filters in that shared space. Um, and they're running at their maximum capacity from the time we open till uh, about 30 minutes after we close and they're set to automatic. Um, so there's no human error to turning them on, turning them off. They're just on when the clinic's open, full stop. Um, the third thing is we have a CO2 monitor inside the waiting room to let us know if the the amount of reused air or rebreathed air is getting quite high in there 420 450 is about the level for fresh air and we try to make sure that our waiting room is kept under 650. Uh, under 800 is generally considered safe for an indoor space but obviously the more people that are in there the more reshared air there's going to be um, and the less opportunity for the filters to do their work before air leaves someone's mouth and into someone else's. Then inside each of the waiting rooms, we have a HEPA filter running at its maximum capacity as well. And they're rostered on for the times the doctors are on. So they start before the, uh, before the doctor starts their session. They end 30 minutes after the session ends as well at the end of the day. Um, and every staff member of ours, doctors, nurses, reception, have to wear an N95 mask at all times when they're in any part of the clinic, with the exception of our tea room, which is right at the back of the clinic and has an open door to let fresh air mix. And that tea room also has a HEPA filter running at any time as well. In terms of patients, we still do see, we see patients face to face, of course, um, and we see patients with respiratory symptoms. In the first instance, we do encourage people through the website and through our booking system, if they've got respiratory symptoms and they don't need to be seen, to encourage a telehealth consult. And our patients are very good at doing that. Um, we've put that on the website many times. We've sent it out in emails to our patients that this is encouraged um, and they continue to take that opportunity. If either after a telehealth consult, we determine that they need to be seen face to face or the patient has made that determination themselves, then they can book an isolation type appointment. Um, and what this means is that all the, the wording towards um, how to visit us uh, make it really clear that they come around the back of the clinic. They check in at the front and then they walk to the back of the clinic and they sit in a couple of the chairs out the back uh, where there's a little table available. Um, we've set it up in a way that if you book an isolation appointment in our appointment booking system, there's an isolation provider. It will double book that person at the same time. And if that isolation provider isn't available, they can't book an ISO appointment. So that means that two people can't book the same ISO appointment at the same time. So I've got a bottleneck of people waiting at the back. If it's okay to examine them outside and the patient agrees, then we do so. We bring our equipment with us outside. Um, we wear a N95 mask or higher with eye protection. Um, and some of our doctors still choose to wear gowns and gloves when they go out, depending on what the patient is presenting for. We examine them outside. We, we look in their ears, we look in their throat if need be, and then we come in and finish our notes. 
Um, most of the time we still do a telehealth consult initially to get the history and then we'll go out to do, minimize our contact time with them. If it's deemed that an examination needs to be a bit more uh, intimate or you know it's not, it's not appropriate to do one outdoors, we've got an isolation room just inside our clinic from the back entrance, uh, which is an empty room with a HEPA filter running all, all the time. Uh, we take our patients in there, we examine them, we do what we need to do, and then we let them go through the back door again um, and they leave. We do all the billing remotely. We ask our receptionist to send them an SMS or an email with payment details, which they can log on to do. They can also pay through HotDoc, or we call them and take payment over the phone. Any pathology scripts we'll send to them via electronic prescription. Any paperwork that we need, we'll email them through our best practice software directly. The only caveat now is imaging and pathology. We have to print those, and then we scan and email those through our receptionist as well. Um, and this minimizes the amount of contact time. And obviously we take extra precautions to make sure that we're extra careful around patients with respiratory symptoms, but this way we can still see them. We can still see them in a very timely fashion. There's no bottleneck of, you know, always the telehealth consult first before we see them. They're able to book those appointments directly themselves. Um, if this all falls through and a patient accidentally books a face-to-face -face consult and they've got symptoms, then everyone that comes into the clinic uh, through the front door is asked, do you have respiratory symptoms? The login screen at the front, the kiosk, also asks people if they have respiratory symptoms, cough, sneezing, fever, body aches, things like that. And it alerts us so we can go and ascertain if they need to be converted to an isolation type appointment as well. Um, by using these processes, there's been no COVID transmission at our clinic at all. Um, and we have immunized well, over 15,000 people so far, or 15,000 immunizations have occurred at our clinic. Um, and despite that, it's been a very safe process for all of us. And I think the main thing is that because all of our doctors and staff feel safer doing this, we don't have this added stress over our heads of, you know, are we gonna catch COVID at work? Ideally, I'd like to reduce the risk of COVID further by implementing, say, um, you know, improved ventilation even more so to make sure that the air coming in through our air conditioning system is coming in from the outside, it's possibly filtered before it comes in, it uses very little recirculated air. We're exploring those options. Um, whether we implement UV filtration into the air that comes into the clinic, uh, UV filtration for the ceilings of the waiting room to make sure that air that is rising up gets, gets cleaned, or the newer technology of far UV, which um, essentially kills you know, bacteria and viruses on contact with the UV light and it's not dangerous to humans. It is a little bit prohibitively expensive at the moment, so we're trying to explore options for that. But addition of that can add the equivalency of another six air exchanges an hour or even more. So. I often feel safer being at the clinic than anywhere else, really. Um, the only other place I feel safe is at home, which uh, I might be a bit of a panicky person, but I've got HEPA filters in the bedroom and the living room running all the time. And when the guests come around, they go on full as well. Um, but yeah, that's how we continue to keep it a safe working environment for our staff and, and for our patients that attend. Um, we've had quite a lot of patients come specifically because we've, we've gone to these extra lengths to look after our patients. People who are afraid to get there, preventative care done elsewhere started to come to us as the word has spread and as we've made it all known that we provide these extra steps, I think it's made it a lot safer. Initially, it took a little bit of thought to set this up and it, and it was a bit of an investment, but I have to say the reduced number of sick days we've had because of doctors, you know, um, it's only when their children are unwell that they have to isolate or if they're getting other respiratory illnesses from being out and about attending weddings, but generally no one's got sick at work and we've seen quite a few sick people during this time, people with confirmed respiratory illnesses, and at times COVID, people that tell us later they had COVID and there's been no transmission. So it's worked well, it continues to work well. I wanna to continue to make it safer for any uh, illnesses that attend our clinic, respiratory or otherwise, um, because I think if it makes it a much safer working environment for us, uh, it is a much more pleasant work environment to be at and the patients really appreciate it as well. So if you have any questions as to what devices we bought and how we sort of implement and maintain these things and what the costs are, please shoot an email to us, give us a call, have a chat, come visit the clinic. We're happy to show you around and show you what we do. Um, but yeah, I think it's worth doing this to make sure that you remain safe. No one wants to catch COVID once, even if it is a mild illness for you. Um, evidence shows the more you catch it, the worse it gets. Autoimmunity, prolonged illnesses, um, you know, secondary conditions that arise as a result of it. It's not a nice thing. We don't know enough about it. Let's avoid it. Let's avoid it in us. Let's avoid it in everyone. And let's keep trying to avoid it as long as we can. Thanks for listening.
Thank you. I would like to thank Daniel um, Chanisef and the Green Screen Green Square Health Practice for um, putting that video together for us tonight. Um, I hope you got a lot out of it. Okay, next up we have Dr. Gary Franks. Um, he's a GP at Shire Family Medical um, and he's going to share with us uh, how they are accommodating uh, respiratory patients at their practice. Thank you, Dr. Gary Franks. Thank you, Kira. Is that coming through okay? Yes, we can hear you, but no video. Oh. Not sure. Yeah, there we go. Says the host has stopped it. Have you stopped the video? Um, no, I just stopped sharing my screen. Uh, it's coming up. Oh, Love there it. we go. We can okay. see you now. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gary. Take care. Thank you, Kira. And good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing briefly tonight what our practice of five GPs at Sutherland has implemented since the start of the pandemic uh, to manage patients with respiratory infections. Uh, as Daniel was speaking, I was feeling a touch like the speaker at a funeral giving a eulogy where the person before him has just said everything that you have prepared. But uh, it's not quite like that. I, I hope that what I share, you can see that I think practices can handle respiratory infections safely and doing things differently. I was a tad surprised that I was asked to present because it's a fairly obvious and common sense arrangement that we do. Uh, and I'm sure many other practices have commenced uh, this for them, themselves. But for us, it has been highly successful in protecting our GPs, our staff, our vulnerable patients, whilst at the same time allowing unwell patients with a respiratory illness to be consulted in a timely manner. It's a practice that we will in fact be continuing long-term uh, and that by now patients are conditioned to, they understand it and it benefits them in the present climate of this ongoing COVID-19, which is now an endemic infection. So before COVID, patients with respiratory infections, probably at your practice as well, were seen throughout a normal consulting day, spread amongst routine bookings uh, in a typical busy general practice. From March 2020, we intentionally divided each morning and afternoon into well and unwell clinics. The well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it's the day-to-day -day consults that we all see but with the unprecedented triaging, both online and phone, to try and ensure patients did not have symptoms suggestive of COVID infection, as well as the normal infection controls Daniel started to explain with compulsory mask wearing by GP and patients, the social distancing in the waiting room, uh, hand, sanitize, hand sanitation, and of course, late more lately, air purifying, which we've undertaken as well. So these obviously make up the majority of consults for a morning and afternoon session. And they include even skin checks, excisions and vaccinations, which we have continued to perform as normal. However, for the last 30 to 60 minutes, depending on demand of clinics, we devote that to consulting unwell patients with any respiratory symptoms. Now, depending on demand, that could be one or two GPs allocated to consult on average three to 10 patients who meet criteria of possible COVID infections. But of course, they're asked to have either a PCR or rat testing to reduce the likelihood of COVID infection and the implications for us. So if positive uh, test result, then we sure we would arrange a telehealth for COVID in the home management, including now antiviral eligibility using health pathways. But if negative, uh, they, the patients are given an appointment time. They're asked to wait in their cars when they arrive, or if suitable weather, they wait outside on chairs provided like Daniel does. 
And in a reception, uh, they are asked to phone reception when they arrive so that reception understand that they're here. Now, at the same time this is happening in the Unwell Clinic and it's running, other GPs are rostered that, who aren't rostered in the clinic that day. They're allocated telehealth or nursing home consults. And that allows the waiting room to be as best as possible empty uh, during the unwell time. Now, uh, the allocated GP or GPs obviously don appropriate full PPE, including N95. And that's when we wear our N95. I, we wear surgical masks the rest of the day. And they are in a room with an air purifier and HEPA filter as well. So then each patient is rung when the waiting room is empty and the last patient has exited. They come straight into the GP consulting room so as not to wait in reception or the waiting room. So after an appropriate examination is undertaken, uh, the consult is terminated uh, and as succinctly as possible, the uh, GP handles the patient that is seen. And then they leave. Uh, we do allow tapping for private patients or bulk bill arrangements are automatically handled. So the GP then continues in that clinic, making consult uh, in succinctly and only for the respiratory complaint that they're presenting with. And obviously this is to reduce exposure time. So the waiting room and the GP room, of course, is cleaned completely after the clinic uh, mini clean is undertaken after each patient of the seat, the handles, et cetera. So, so far every day for the last two and a half years, this procedure has been implemented with the outcome that again, for our practice, no GP or staff member has been infected with COVID-19 at work. And this is despite a number of patients as well for us ringing to say that they were infected a couple of days after consulting us uh, in, uh, implying that, again, the appropriate mask wearing of doctor and patient has a huge impact on that, plus air filtration. Now, the benefits of strategies like this are pretty obvious. Uh, firstly, the protection of GPs and staff and vulnerable patients who may be in the waiting room. Secondly, uh, reduce waiting for unwell patients who are understanding and appreciative of the option of two time periods during the day to be seen by a GP and not having to attend either a respiratory clinic or ED. Thirdly, patients are seen within a fairly timely manner after their illness onset, especially now with rat testing able to allow us to do the best we can to exclude COVID and not wait as long as when we all had to with PCR testing. Fourthly, many associated complications of respiratory infections have been diagnosed and managed such as asthma, secondary bacterial infections, atypical infections. And lastly, I believe a reduction in the load of ED presentations of mild to moderate respiratory infections at a time when our colleagues in the hospital arena need all the help that we can give them during this crisis, and especially elderly and young people. The Unwell Respiratory Clinic has now become a standard part of a day's work, and one that I believe has uh, reduce the risk of, in, of respiratory infections for GPs rather than increase the risk. It is one that is easy to introduce and to continue long term and is accepted by GPs, staff and patients. Let me encourage you if your practice is not consulting patients with respiratory infections to at least give this a try or what Daniel has. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gary Franks. That was really good. It's it's great to hear um, that the things that you're doing in your practice um, seem to be working and hopefully it gives some insights to um, other practices on um, how we can possibly improve to hopefully give the best care we can to our community over all settings. Um, I did have a question. Um, you mentioned that you were doing a uh, RAT a PCR or RAT negative um, before consult. How have your patients um, you know, receive that? Have there, has there been any um, complaints from patients regarding that? Very few. Uh, obviously, again, when the PCR was difficult to obtain and then waiting for uh, prolonged results, the patients were concerned that here they are with a respiratory infection and they may not be able to be seen until the next day. With rats, 
and I appreciate the limitation, but uh, a positive wrap uh, with symptomatic patient at least gives us a clue on which way we're going. And mm -hmm. so, no, in general now with rat testing, it's been much more accepted because they can, in general, be seen the same day as they ring for presentation. Uh, rat testing before the symptoms, obviously, no, uh, it's on the day that they're coming with the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And is that um, done with a rat on site or do they just have to show you no, a photo beforehand? No, we encourage them to do their own. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then how did your staff adopt the changes? Really well, actually. Yeah. They, they, we obviously, like most practices, had staff meetings and we discussed which strategy we were going to use. And so once everyone is on the same page, has the ability to have input in problem solving or issues that I couldn't see, uh, they all adopted it. And all the GPs have, and look, it obviously depends on the competency of your staff in doing really efficient triaging. So we've depended on that and give credit due to um, GP staff. An exceptional job has been undertaken to really pedantically daily repeat this over and over again. And uh, to the point where patients obviously are expecting the questions and you have to uh, ask curly ones around that. But uh, that has, I believe, kept us safe and be able to uh, work out whether they should be seen or dealt with by telehealth. Yeah, okay. So for um, that, you know, the staff accommodating those changes, um, I guess, what kind of training did you provide, not to your GP so much, but to your practice manager and practice staff? Was it just those, you know, uh, inter in internal meetings or did you provide them with any, you know, online webinars or? Well, uh, PHN provided a consult with a, uh, an infectious yes. disease specialist. And so we ran through with that disease specialist, infectious disease specialist from Melbourne and that was most helpful. She, she uh, gave us a few flaws in what we're doing, but at the same time uh, explained that, okay, what we're doing sounded efficient, safe. Uh, so we passed that on to staff. Uh, we communicate extreme as best we can uh, through a WhatsApp group. So any news, any changes, infection control, staff are educated via that means as well. And then with our nurse and being our liaison between staff as well as the practice manager. So obviously training was a essential part of the whole process and being willing to adapt. We're all learning how to do that with the changes that are taking place. And uh, so, you know, I, I think our staff have done a wonderful job. Yeah, as they all have, I commend you all out there. Um, as, and then just from that as well, I just wanted to plug our, um, our infection control specialist. Um, she's still available to, for consults with general practice. So if anyone, um, any general practice out there that hasn't had a consult yet um, would like one or even would like a second, please email the coronavirus email. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Gary, um, in terms of the change in structures uh, that you've made, um, how has this affected the cost of running the practice and the overheads? Yes. Uh... Look, it, I, to be fair, I, I think the because we vaccinated as well thousands of people, I think the and on the ongoing vaccination program, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, the income generated through that has helped subsidise the costs involved with the expensive air purifiers, uh, the PPE that we want to obtain sometimes and can't obtain. The uh, so the cleaning solutions, all the things that every practice is finding, I, I think it's about on par. Uh, it may not stay that way with more purchase of air purifiers, etc. But uh, I don't feel that we've suffered as a result of this, as compared to other people in the community. That's for sure. Okay, that's great to hear. Mm. Um, and then um, for people, for patients that are rat positive, um, so they obviously can't come into the practice. So what happens for them? Well, uh, we have an opportunity in our rear car park and I have actually examined in PPE patients who are positive out there, but it's more the triaging ourselves personally via telehealth. 
to strategize, uh, are they suitable for obviously antivirals, but also earlier on before we had those, uh, to run through the health pathways, provide the obvious online or information that we could email to patients, uh, provision of, again, oxygen, pulse oximeters, uh, prescribing remotely, all the things that GPs have been doing. It's fairly standard. We, I think it's fair to say we've become accustomed to handling those. And so far, I, I think it's been very successful. Yep. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your contribution tonight. Um, it's great to hear how you um, how you do things at your practice. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, Kate Schleeman. She is a RN at uh, Rose Bay Medical Clinic and she is joining us um, to give us things from a nurse perspective um, at her practice. So Kate, please take the floor. Hello, um, thank you everyone for sticking around for this part of the presentation. Um, it was, it's been really interesting tonight to listen to everyone's different perspectives on how their practices are running. Um, makes it, it's, I've actually written myself quite a little pile of notes of things that we could do to improve our practice. Um, so anyway, let me share my screen. I just made a little brief PowerPoint presentation. Give me one second. Oh. There we go. Share. Perfect. Oops, sorry. Sorry, everyone, I'm not the most technologically savvy this time of night. Perfect. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the practice. So I work at the Rose Bay Medical Clinic. We're just a very small GP practice in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, we're a private billing clinic. We have five GPs that work a combination of full-time and part-time. We're open seven days a week, which... Uh, during the last two and a half years has been quite helpful for patients on the weekends. Um, as I said, we're quite a small practice. We've only got about 4,000 active patients and 25% of our patients are actually under the age of 10. So quite a large pediatric population. Um, for the last probably year, We've been open, or since rapid tests actually became a, became a thing, um, more so. We've all our GPs are happy to see respiratory patients. Obviously, not COVID positive respiratory patients, but other respiratory illnesses, and we will see them face to face. Um, we do ask that they have a negative rapid antigen test taken on the day of their appointment. The preference being PCR if time is allowing, if we can't see them on the day. And that just then allows the GPs to determine if there's any influenza or other um, respiratory viruses as well as COVID. Um, we've, as has everybody at the moment, um, had a little issue trying to fit patients in. We've you know, usually fully booked a couple of days in advance and we've just had such, as has everybody, such an influx of acutely unwell respiratory patients over the last few months. Trying to find appointments for them has been tricky, but our GPs have actually been wonderful in recognising that, you know, everyone's quite stressed at the moment. The hospitals are a bit overwhelmed. We need to squeeze these patients in, otherwise they're going to end up in ED. So reception, um, we have, you know, a big meeting, practice meeting on how can we as a practice cram extra patients in our day. So generally reception or myself will triage um, patients over the phone to determine do they need an urgent appointment? Um, is it emergent? Is it at the end of the day? Could it be a phone consult if, you know, if possible? But with children, it is a little, little harder. Um, we'll also sometimes liaise with the GP because the GPs do know their patients quite well and can help with that. And we, we do aim to fit in acutely unwell children on the day if possible. Most of the time we can squeeze them in. Um, on occasion, it's not to the next day. We tend to pr uh, prioritize unwell children just because they tend to be more unwell. Ad you know, unwell adults tend to be able to wait a little bit longer. Um, we do, if we can't squeeze them in, there are quite a few GP practices around Rose Bay as well that we refer patients to, as well as some um, medical walk-in medical centers up at Bonnet Junction. We try to refer people to the emergency department if we can't see them as sort of a last ditch thing or if they're so acutely unwell. Um, our GPs are very good at squeezing patients in. As I said, we usually at the beginning of the day say, where can we possibly fit these people in? And they'll just tell us, you know, for example, we've got a patient's come, you know, four month immunisation. The nurse, me, is going to see them. So it will only take the GP a short period of time so we could cram another one or two 
quick respiratory patients in there to try and get them seen. Um, infection control in our practice where um, we do ask that all patients over to wear a mask if they you know if they'd like um, we all patients over 12 must wear a mask we have a practice policy as do most patients most practices that if patients are unable to wear a mask or unwilling to wear a mask that they have a telehealth consult instead um, we do screen all our patients as does everybody else I guess for respiratory symptoms on the phone and then again in person we actually Im implemented a, um, a little piece of paper that we get patients to tick yes or no and sign because we found that a lot of patients were not completely honest about their respiratory symptoms until they got into the doctor's room. Um, but I'm sure that's that's not just unique to us. Um, all our GPs wear N95 and uh, N95 is an eye protection for all patients, regardless of respiratory status. We, as you know, as does everyone, clean all our hard and soft surfaces. Um, we clean them routinely twice a day, as well as in between respiratory patients. All our offices have air purifiers in them. And we're very lucky, as you can see from this picture, we're quite quite a nice open practice. We have the front door open, a back door open. Each doctor's office has a window. And as Gary was saying, we had a wonderful consultation with the infectious diseases physician through PHN, who gave us some wonderful advice about how important fresh airflow in a practice is. So every chance we get the front doors open, the back doors open, the windows are open. Um, unfortunately, we are on a main road, so it does involve an awful lot of dirt and dust in the practice, but that's better than COVID, so we're happy. Um, we tend to get our respiratory patients to anybody that is coming in with respiratory symptoms. We ask them to wait either on the veranda or in their car um, and to call us on arrival, and then we can let them know as soon as the doctor's ready. Um, we do try and encourage telehealth, but it is a little bit tricky. Um, we try to minimise the amount of time they are on site, purely because any time they're spent in the practice is time they can spend infecting patients in the waiting room, staff, etc. So we do try and get them to pay via phone at the end. We text them their scripts, their pathology tests, things like that. We try to make their appointments as brief as possible, a quick assessment, and then off you go. Um, we're sort of thinking about some ideas for the future because you know nobody's perfect and we're always trying to improve practices recommendations change we have you know we would love to put aside some dedicated appointments for day of appointment bookings because we just have been inundated with patient requests for appointments lately everybody's sick and every day we're probably turning away at least a good 10 or 15 patients that we just can't see um, we would love to have a spare dedicated office just to see our respiratory patients in. Um, we don't have a spare office at the moment, but that would be ideal is to try and have our own respiratory room that our infectious patients can be in and therefore the doctors in between patients aren't still sitting in a room that's potentially infectious. Um, so we'd like to allocate time to see our respiratory patients. I quite like um, uh, Dr. Franks's idea that at the end of the day, there's a good you know, hour of time that doctors can see their respiratory patients in. That would actually be wonderful. And then it's separate to our routine patients, you know, reduction of cross-contamination and things like that. And also just improved airflow and filtration. We've got air filters, but um, there's always, always room for improvement and to try and decrease. Because some days we just have so many patients coughing and spluttering that it's only a matter of time before, you know, the air filters can only, the HEPA filters can only do as much as they can. Um, yeah, that was us. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, it was really good for you to highlight not only the strengths, but the shortcomings as um, all practices have. Um, and, you know, we're always looking to improve on our practices. So, yeah, great to highlight that too. Thank you so much. Um, I did have one question. Um, you know, obviously it's COVID thing going on about two years now. Um, whose role is it within the practice to increase morale within staff? Or is it everyone's or like, and how do you do that? Um, I think mean, generally we're, it, it is hard because on, as I'm sure everybody's the same, it's not the, the same environment. Nobody congregates in tea rooms anymore and it's, it can get quite a bit depressing. Everyone's in PPE and everyone's just scared of infection everywhere. And so we, I think we all just try to do our best and keep it light. One of the GPs was just telling me yesterday that she's very glad that we see respiratory patients because it breaks it up. Otherwise, or if you don't see respiratory patients or patients with sore throats, the simple things, working as a GP can get a bit depressing that you're just constantly seeing people with 
you know, depression and anxiety and horrible things happening in their lives. So actually seeing respiratory patients breaks it up a little bit. Mm. And I thought that was actually a really interesting perspective, a nice way to put a positive spin on it, that I wasn't spending my entire day dealing with the sadness that can happen as a GP. It's actually breaking up with little kids and, you know, sure they're coughing and spluttering, but it's simple. It's, you know, simpler to deal with. So we all just... Try to get through it. I love that silver lining. Yeah. (laughs) Good. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, Kate. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. I've just got a couple more things to share with you all before we head off for the evening. Um, And of Oh, sorry, I just muted and vid- videoed myself. Our participants um, are still online. So if you have any last questions, please put them through now. Um, and I will just share my screen again. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to share with you um, some resources and uh, top tips. Um, so, you know, as mentioned tonight, um, we have our infection prevention training down here funded by Sesman and it's with um, Marge Jen- Jennings, who's a infectious disease specialist. So she can um, have a consult with you um, in your, you know, in your practice via Zoom um, on, you know, you can tell her what you're doing and how, she, how she, and then she can give you some tips on how to improve that infection prevention um, so yeah, please email us at coronavirus uh, if you have if you want to engage in that. Um, with, there is a RACGP winter planning toolkit, which is available, which is um, a great resource uh, to start with in, in terms of seeing how you can improve, um, maybe not even this year, but in future years, how to plan better within your practice. As always, Health Direct is there. Um, there's the NCS immunization um, coverage data for influenza. Um, so you can see how we're going this year compared to other years. Um, and, you know, as, as Lucy mentioned before, we have great COVID vaccination rates um, but not so great influenza coverage rates so um, as always the number one thing is a recommendation from someone's health provider Um, and we hope to as well have some uh, have a webinar coming up soon on addressing vaccine hesitancy so um, you know how to have that conversation with not those people that are you know completely opposed to vaccination but just have a a bit of trouble and need a bit more time to chat it through Um, so yeah hopefully that will be coming up in the next few months for you so keep an eye on the uh, events web page um, we also have some links to um, pen and polar uh, work throughs that you can do um, with your data um, and a really important one I think um, is the COVID-19 weekly webinar with the Department of Health um, which is every week at on Thursday at 11 30 a.m um, and if you're not getting those emails already from the Department of Health because you haven't previously subscribed, let us know at immunization or coronavirus email and we can um, direct you to where to subscribe to those links to attend those webinars because um, they're, they're for primary care providers and they're really helpful to what's going on that week in the primary care scene. Um, and of course, our assessment influenza uh, website and then our COVID-19 vaccine website that has all the latest information regarding our um, vaccines and everything related to that. Um, and then we also have links to the COVID at home service um, and health pathways there. Um, and then lastly, just, you know, if, if you um, aren't able to see your patients in um, in the amount of time that you want to, you can always refer them to the local GPRC. So there's one in Bondi Junction, Belmore, Inner West um, and Lakemba. And then as well, there's, a, there's the St. George After Hours Clinic at St. George Private Hospital. And lastly, just some COVID-19 resources. Um, so we try and update our, our page ourselves, um, but as well as the New South Wales Health Coronavirus information, and of course the Department of Health website. Um, and lastly, there's some um, email addresses for you. Please reach out to us if you have any questions, concerns or otherwise, um, we're here to support you. Um, I hope you had. Um, I hope there's one more question. Oh, there is a question. Thank you, Mimi. Um, do we have any tips on how to support parents who may have an unwell child who presents to the practice with a respiratory illness, but is not sick enough to attend ED? Um, Dr. Gary or Lucy or um, Kate, anyone want to take that question? Yeah, if my videos. Yeah, that's okay. We can still hear you. It doesn't okay. matter if the videos. Okay. Well, I don't think that's changed because of COVID, to be honest. Uh, 
all, all patients with sick children, we give opportunity to uh, have review uh, either by phone or by consult because of the fact that kids' viruses can change. Uh, it, it can be, they can be well one day and very unwell the next day. So we need to, and I encourage patients and, and, and thank them for bringing them up and acknowledge the, their concerns because even though it might be just what appears to be a mild viral illness, it's an opportunity to educate, it's an opportunity to examine that child and uh, to reassure the parent that it's that's only mild at the moment, but it can change and therefore uh, they need to contact us again. So I, I don't know that that's changed that much the reassurance of parents. Yeah, that's a, a great way to end out our session. I think that, you know, every contact with a patient is an opportunity for education um, and growth. So thank you again very much for everybody this evening. I hope you've gotten something out of it. Um, and share, please share with all your colleagues as it will be available as a recording um, in a few days. Thank you. Thanks.